Welcome back, everyone. This is lecture number three, Genomes and Genetics. Today, we are going to explore the nature of the viral genome and how you can manipulate it experimentally. And this all begins in the 1950s. And that's when we realized that the viral nucleic acid is the genetic code. And we had only learned that DNA for bacteria was the genetic code in 1944, where when Avery, McLeod, and McCarty, working at the Rockefeller, found that DNA of bacteria is what determines its properties, the so-called transformation principle. And, but for viruses, it wasn't shown until the 50s. And that work was done with two viruses, which are shown here a DNA-containing virus, a bacteriophage, in particular phage T4. That was the famous Hershey-Chase experiment. And then for RNA viruses, the experiment was done using tobacco mosaic virus. And I want to go over both of these with you because they're, they're quite important. The first, the Hershey-Chase experiment. You probably learned about this in high school, but probably haven't. And maybe you heard about it again in biology here, but haven't thought about it much. A very famous experiment done by Alfred Hershey here and Martha Chase in 1952. And, and Hershey won the Nobel Prize uh, years later in, in part for this. And this is a famous experiment because it involved the use of a kitchen blender, right? And what he did was to, he wanted to know what's, what's the genetic information? Is it the DNA of the phage or the RNA? We knew that these phages had both DNA and RNA, uh, sorry, DNA and protein. I don't know if I said RNA before. He wanted to know if the DNA or the protein of the phage was the genetic information. And I have to say, from the discovery of DNA and protein through 1944, most people thought that protein was the genetic material, right? Because it was way more complicated than DNA, which only had four, four bases. So what, what Hershey and Chase did was they radioactively labeled phage, either with radioactive sulfur to label the proteins or with radioactive DNA, with, with phosphorus to uh, label the DNA. And then he infected bacteria, and he would absorb for a short period of time. And then he put the bacteria in a blender to shear off the phages so no more entry would occur, and he synchronized the infection. And then he would let the infection proceed, and then he would look at the progeny phage and ask, where is the radioactivity? When you used radioactive protein, there was never any radioactivity in the progeny phage, but if you used radioactive DNA, you could find radioactivity in the progeny phage. So that told him that the DNA is the genetic material that ends up in the progeny bacteria phages, and this the shearing was done by the blender. And you can find this blender. Here's a picture of it. Uh, there's a museum at Cold Spring Harbor out on Long Island, and in, in the museum, they have his blender here. And um, this is a letter from him there as well. It's pretty cool. So that's the Hershey Chase experiment. Uh, and, you know, he was he was lucky because this for this phage, the, um, the, the, the protein doesn't get into the cell. Only the DNA gets in the cell, we now know. But there are some phages where the protein gets in along with the DNA. And that could have complicated things if he had used that, but he didn't. All right, so then... How about RNA viruses? This was called the Frankel Conrad experiment. It was done using tobacco mosaic virus. So here's tobacco mosaic virus on the left. And he had two, two strains of tobacco mosaic virus, which could be distinguished by their coat proteins. So you could, you could and I labeled them green and red here. And remember, this virus is, is simply a piece of RNA in green, and, and it's bound to many copies of the coat protein which protects it. So what he, what he could do uh, is separate the protein from the RNA in the lab. He could separate them and purify them. And then he could mix them and reassemble particles. And so what he did was he took green RNA and red RNA and mixed them with the opposite coat protein. So he mixed green RNA with a red coat protein and uh, red RNA with green coat, and he, he reassembled these particles. He just mixed the RNA and the protein, they reassemble into a virus particle. And then he took this virus and infected tobacco leaves. And what came out, the coat protein always was 
reflective of the RNA. So the virus with green RNA always made green coat proteins, and the virus with red RNA always made red coat proteins. So showing that the coat protein is encoded uh, in the RNA. So DNA and RNA is the genetic material. But as we studied viruses through the 60s and 70s, remember this, this, these experiments were done in the 50s, you know, we discovered lots and lots of viruses, you know, many, many different kinds of virus particles and a lot of complexity. But it turned out there's a finite number of viral genomes. And the number is seven, which you can remember from the subway sign, number seven. I always like to ask people, well, how many genomes are there? Seven. There's not a hundred, there's not thousands, there's just seven. And that's what I want to talk about a bit today here seven different kinds of genome. And not only is that a unifying feature, we can use it to put order to all the viruses in the, on the planet. Every virus genome has to end up as mRNA that can be read by host ribosomes. Every virus we know of on the planet follows this rule. There's no exception. Every virus genome has to make mRNA, no matter what the genome is. And you'll see how this plays out in a moment. That, by the way, in the middle uh, is a ribosome. It looks like a turkey, but it's a ribosome with the large and small subunits. And every mRNA made by a virus has to be engaged by cell ribosomes because viruses do not encode ribosomes. They don't encode a translational machinery. So the seven kinds of RNA and this idea that mRNA has to be engaged by host ribosomes can be used to unify all of the viruses on the planet. And this was done by David Baltimore uh, in the 70s. He used this insight, the insight meaning that all viruses need to make mRNA to, to devise a simple way to talk about viral genomes or to think about them. Here's David Baltimore. He uh, won a Nobel Prize for discovery of reverse transcriptase. And we'll come back to that in a later lecture. It's quite an important discovery. So he said there are six types of viral genome. And he missed one, the seventh, because we didn't know those viruses back when he did this. He said there, there are all these different kinds of genomes, and we can put them on a chart like this with mRNA in the middle because all of these genomes have to go to mRNA. Uh, so he had found groups one through six, and then the seventh group or class is uh, the gapped DNA of, of hepadnavir day, which we'll talk a little bit about today as well. So we have viruses with DNA, double-stranded DNA genomes, single-stranded DNA genomes. We have viruses with double-stranded RNA, and then three different kinds of single-stranded RNA genomes. We have uh, viruses with plus-stranded RNA genomes. We have viruses with minus stranded RNA genomes. And then we have viruses that have plus RNA, but they go through a DNA intermediate. Seven kinds of viral genome. Oh, sorry, seven, seven is the gap DNA of the hepatinovirus. So it's double stranded, but it has gaps. And we'll, we'll explore that in a moment. So um, before we go further into this, I call this the Baltimore scheme. And I think this is brilliant for reasons that you'll see in a moment but we have to do some definitions so you know what I'm talking about. So first of all, when, when I say plus, uh, that means it is the same polarity as mRNA. A, a better way to put that would be mRNA, which, which can be translated, we say it's ribosome ready, is always the plus strand. And you may say, why plus? Does it have to do with charge or polarity? No, it has nothing to do with any chemical property. It was just a convention. Plus is mRNA. All right, and so DNA of the same polarity as, say, mRNA would also be the plus strand. And so if you have a double-stranded DNA, there's a plus and a minus strand, and the plus would be the same polarity as mRNA. And the complements are the minus strands, and that can be complements of DNA or RNA plus strands would be minus strands or negative strands. All right, so I use these a lot throughout this course. I would talk about plus-stranded viruses or minus-stranded viruses, et cetera. And so that is what we are talking about on this Baltimore scheme when we have plus DNA. It's the same strand as mRNA. However, there's a caveat here. And, you know, in biology, nothing is black and white. If you remember that, you'll go far. There's always 
var variations on a theme. Not all plus RNA is mRNA, even though mRNA is always the plus strand. Not all plus RNA is mRNA. There's some viruses for which their plus RNA is not translated. And this is a good example, group six, which comprises the retroviruses, as you'll see. They have plus RNA in the particle, the virus particle, but upon infection, it is not translated. It is made into DNA. So you can't assume that just because there's a plus RNA that it's going to be translated. Okay. Now, the beauty of this system is that if I tell you the nature of the viral genome, you can tell me exactly how it gets to mRNA. You need a few more facts to do that, but they're relatively straightforward. So, for example, uh, let's start with class one, double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA is the only DNA that can be transcribed by RNA polymerase to make mRNA. You cannot transcribe single-stranded DNA. It has to be made double-stranded first. Now, transcription is a specific word I use, and we'll talk about this in its own lecture, to, to mean the copying of DNA into mRNA. That's transcription, okay? Double-stranded DNA among the DNA molecules, and there are only three on this slide, really. There's double-stranded, single-stranded, and gapped. Only double-stranded DNA can be made into mRNA. So we put mRNA at the middle because all the genomes have to get to it. So the single-stranded DNA can't be transcribed. It has to be made double-stranded first. And the gap DNA cannot be transcribed. It has to be made double-stranded. So just remember that. Double-stranded DNA is the only DNA that you can make mRNA from. Okay, so now we move to our RNA viruses, the double-stranded RNA. Now that has a plus and a minus strand. But the plus strand is inaccessible to ribosomes because it's in a duplex. It's double-stranded. Ribosomes can't get to it. So double-stranded RNA viruses have to copy the minus strand in the duplex to make mRNA. The double-stranded RNA cannot be translated. And the, the implications of that for infection, uh, you'll, you'll see as we, as we go through the RNA viruses. But these viruses have to have an RNA polymerase in the particle to make mRNA because the cell cannot make RNA from RNA viruses. That's another factoid you're going to have to remember besides the double-stranded DNA one. And then let's move to uh, single-stranded RNA. Let's start with the plus RNA. Now, the plus-stranded RNA viruses, and this, this includes coronaviruses and, and many others, the plus RNA can be translated when it gets into a cell. So in, in many ways, this is mRNA. Now, I have an, a minus RNA in this pathway here just to show you that if you wanted to make more mRNA from the, from the plus RNA genome, which is already some mRNA, right, you have to make a minus RNA intermediate. And the, that's done again by a viral enzyme called an RNA polymerase, which we'll explore a lot more. Okay, then um, we have viruses with negative strand RNA genomes. That means that they cannot be translated by the cell. Okay, if a negative strand gets into a cell, it's done unless there is an RNA polymerase that goes in with it, a viral RNA polymerase that can make mRNA from that negative strand. And and again, that's very important to not understand that R minus RNA can't be translated. It has to be copied by a viral enzyme because the cell does not have the enzymatic activity to copy RNA. It has the activity to copy DNA into both DNA and RNA, but not RNA into RNA. So minus RNA viruses have to be copied to form mRNAs. And then finally, we have our uh, viruses with a plus RNA, which in theory could be translated, but it's not when it gets into cells. Actually, it remains in the viral capsid or the viral particle, and there's an enzyme in the particle that copies it to first single-stranded and then double-stranded DNA. And as you will see, that double-stranded DNA then goes in the nucleus of the cell. It integrates into the nuclear DNA and there it is transcribed to make mRNA. So I could give you any of these seven genomes and I could say, how does this get to mRNA? And you can figure it out. It's intuitive. As long as you remember, only double-stranded DNA can be transcribed, only plus RNA can be translated, and only and double-stranded RNA, the plus strand is not accessible. So we have seven classes of viral genomes. Here they are. We have three 
classes of DNA, double-stranded DNA, gap double-stranded DNA, or single-stranded DNA. And again, these are found in viruses. These are the seven different kinds of genome that we find in variety of viruses, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. And then we have three uh, classes with uh, single-stranded RNA, two with plus RNA, and one of them has a DNA intermediate, and um, one with minus RNA. All right, question one, why is mRNA placed at the center of the Baltimore scheme? A, because all virus particles contain mRNA. There's no specific reason because all viral genomes are mRNAs because mRNAs must be made from all viral genomes or because Baltimore studied mRNA. I've right, got a couple of questions here in the chat. How do we distinguish between four and six if they start from plus RNA? Because one of them goes through a DNA intermediate. Could you clarify how double-stranded RNA gets to mRNA? So double-stranded RNA has plus and minus strands, right? It has an mRNA, but the mRNA can't be bound by ribosomes because it's double-stranded. You need a single-stranded mRNA to bind a ribosome. So the virus particle inside the particle is double-stranded RNA and an enzyme, an RNA polymerase, which goes in the cell with the RNA, and then it copies the RNA to make an mRNA. It will copy the minus strand, of course, to make a mRNA strand. Now let's see how we did here. 99% of you got the right answer, which is D, because mRNA must be made from all viral genomes. That's the correct, that's why we put mRNA at the center, because all the genomes have to make uh, mRNA. None of the other answers. But certainly, all virus particles do not contain mRNA, right? No way. I haven't told you that much, but I've told you there's seven kinds of genome. Now, in addition to these seven genome types that we've just talked about, there are also many varieties of structures of, of these genomes, and some of them are shown here. For example, our DNA genomes can be linear. So here's a double-stranded linear genome. Here's a single-stranded, or this is a double-stranded circular genome. So they can be circular, or and they can be singular double-stranded circles. Um, here is a RNA genome that's circular also. Uh, the genomes can be segmented. That is, they occur in pieces. Here's a, a virus with eight strands of negative RNA. And by the way, I use a color code in, in all these figures. These figures are from Principles of Virology. And we have a color code for nucleic acids. Blue is DNA, and the, the two strands are distinguished by the color, light blue and dark blue. And then the RNA is also colored. It's green, and the, this, um, I don't know what color green I would call this. <laughs> this green is negative strand, and the Kelly green is plus. I guess it's an olive green. This would be the negative strand. And this one is, uh, the Kelly green is the plus strand. So you can tell right away the polarities. We have single-stranded plus-stranded genomes, as you might guess, single-stranded minus strand. And we can have ambisense genomes, which have both polarities. I'll talk about that today. Here's double-stranded RNA or double-stranded DNA. Sometimes proteins are attached. In this case, the RNA. There's some protein attached to this double-stranded DNA at the top here. Uh, sometimes the double-stranded DNA, the ends are covalently joined, and so they're linked. And then, of course, this, this is the gapped DNA that we mentioned. And this DNA not only is gapped, but... It has both an RNA and a protein attached to it. And we'll explore that in more detail. But I just want to point out that the um, configuration, aside from those seven forms, can be quite diverse. Now, why is this? Why do we have, or I should say, what's the function? I try to avoid why questions in biology, because that's a philosophical question. In my view, you know, your view may be different. That's fine. I'd rather say, what is the function of genome diversity? But sometimes I lapse into why, because I use why in the rest of my life, right? All right, so first of all, why? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> What's the function of DNA and RNA-based genomes? What is the function or the reason that they are both present? Well, uh, we, we feel that RNA genomes were the first on the planet in the RNA world, which we'll explore a bit later. It was a time very early in evolution when RNA molecules appeared and the first cells were probably RNA-based cells. The first viruses were RNA-based. Slowly, there was an evolution to DNA-based viruses and cells, and that probably happened accidentally, but it was then advantageous because 
the RNA genomes can't get very big. You know, the, the biggest RNA genomes we know of are 41,000 bases. And, you know, your genome is, is billions of bases long. So to make complex cells and organisms, you needed DNA. And that's the driving selective force, we think, for that. So today we only have RNA viral genomes. RNA as a genome only exists in viruses. So viruses are really relics of the RNA world. And there's an organism called a viroid which uh, we will talk about later in this course, uh, which is a is a small piece of RNA shown here. It is uh, circular, 100, 200 bases of RNA, no coding potential. It doesn't code for any proteins. And that's what we think the RNA world initially was, no protein coding potential, no ribosomes, just RNAs being able to replicate. And they still exist, these viroids today. We, but so that's... The, the, the reason for RNA and DNA today, but linear, circular, segmented, double or single-stranded, plus, minus, they all can work. That's the only reason we understand for their existence today. Each of these is evolutionarily successful. They work, and so they exist. In my view, if I were going to design viruses, I'd make them all plus-stranded RNA because the RNAs in the virus particle, it's very simple. RNA and protein are membrane. You don't need an enzyme in the particle because as soon as the RNA gets in the cell, it's translated to make all the proteins you need. Ultimate simplicity, and most of the viral pathogens in the world are plus RNA viruses, but there are others, and so obviously the others can find a niche as well. I would suggest you remember these seven types. Um, you, you don't have to, actually, because if you know when your exam, you can look at the picture. But um, if, if you want to, you know, if you become a doctor one day and your patient says, what does it mean that corona, SARS-CoV-2 is a plus-stranded RNA virus? If you don't know, they're not going to be very happy. They have to pay you a lot of money to take care of them. So um, I would learn it. And they'll, they may even ask you, uh, what's the function of a plus-strand? So I think you should know this. I think everybody should know it, but that's another story. So memorize the seven genome types. And in this course, we're mainly going to focus on a few viruses. And there, you should know some examples of each genome type, like the single-stranded DNA viruses of parvoviruses. You know, if you have a pet, you have to immunize them against parvoviruses. The double-stranded DNAs here, the, there are adenoviruses and herpes viruses. The, the gapped ones are hepatitis B virus. Rio virus for double-stranded RNA, influenza virus for minus RNA, and then poliovirus and coronaviruses for plus strands, and then retroviruses for the plus RNAs that go through single uh, DNA intermediate. So you should know examples of each of these genomes. And um, of course, again, on your exam, you're going to be able to look at pictures. So if I say, how does adenovirus make mRNA? You can look at the Baltimore scheme and figure it out. So if I, if you know the genome structure, as I as I've told you, you should know how mRNA is made from the genome. But you should also know how the genome is copied, and and you know we'll get into more detail in subsequent lectures. Uh, but here, for example, the genome is copied by making a minus strand intermediate in the case of plus stranded RNA viruses. Let's let's talk now about these genomes. We know there are seven classes. They're structurally diverse what's encoded in a viral genome. And you'll see in a moment, some viral genomes encode one protein and others encode thousands. So there's a big range in viruses. We have uh, gene products and regulatory signals. So the genome isn't all protein coding. It has regulatory signals. And you need signals for pr protein synthesis. And, and there are actually some gene products in the giant viruses that are involved in protein synthesis, like... Uh, tRNAs and tRNA synthetases, and even ribosomal subunits, but not the in, entire ribosome. There are gene products for replication of the genome. Some viruses encode uh, a polymerase. Uh, in fact, all RNA viruses encode an RNA polymerase without exception. It's just among the DNA viruses, as you'll see in a moment, that some of them do not encode a DNA polymerase but many other uh, enzymes involved in replication, assembly, and packaging of the genome into a particle, so structural proteins, uh, genes for regulating the replication cycle for timing and so forth. And here is a, a really important one, genes, gene products for modulating host defenses. Every virus on the planet 
encodes at least one gene product that antagonizes immune responses. Otherwise, it's not; it doesn't exist. It can't get a, uh, it, it cannot exist on the planet without antagonizing immune defenses. And spread, and they encode products that are needed for spread to other cells. And we're going to explore all these gene products in um, subsequent lectures. Here's a very cool virus for many reasons. It was isolated in Brazil. It's called Tupan virus, which I love the name. And it's beautiful. Look at the picture of this virus. Of course, they colored it blue. It's not really blue, obviously. But I like their choice of color. And it's a big virus. And it's got a, a spherical top where the DNA is. And it's got this structure on the bottom. We don't know what that is. I mean, some people think these look like bacteriophages. But they actually don't infect bacteria. But anyway... This viral genome encodes 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, one for each of the amino acids, 70 tRNAs, multiple translation initiation and elongation proteins, multiple translation-related genes. It has the most complete translational apparatus of the virus sphere. The virus sphere, by the way, is all the viruses on the planet. That's what I mean by that. It's kind of Earth's virome, if you will. It's another way to put it. Now, this was... In, in, a, in a review article written by a French group of virologists, they, they wrote, only the ribosome is lacking, which is, is a particularly French way of making this English statement, right? I love it. I think it's great. And I will um, r remark later in this course on other interesting ways the French um, name things. So someone wrote, Tupan comes from the indigenous mythology in the Brazil, the god of the sun. Yeah, thank you, because I, I had forgotten that. I knew it st stood for something interesting, but I forgot. Yeah, it's very cool. Anyway, um, what about stuff that's not contained in viral genomes? Well, there are no genes encoding the complete protein synthesis machinery. I've now said this multiple times. Viruses can have components of it, but no virus has a complete protein synthesis machinery. You know, viruses are dependent on the host cell for all kinds of things, including the translation apparatus. And so people often say, well, would there ever be a virus that encodes the complete translation apparatus? Maybe. It would still be a virus because it would need many other things from the cell. And you may ask, why does a, or what's the function of encoding parts of the translational apparatus? And the answer is, probably to bias translation towards viral proteins. You make your own tRNAs and synthetases and so forth, and you know, you, you make less cell protein and more viral protein. I mean, that's a, unfortunately, that's a humanized view of why, of you know, the function of that. That's what we think would be, make sense. But as I said in lecture one, don't fall into the trap of using human logic for understanding what viruses are doing. There are no genes for proteins involved in membrane biosynthesis. There's no centromeres or telomeres like we have in our chromosomes, right, to help with segregation. But, you know, every year I, this slide gets shorter and shorter because as we sequence more genomes, we find some of these proteins. For example, this first one, when I started this course 11 years ago, there were no genes. And I said, no virus encodes any part of the translational apparatus, and it slowly changes. I used to have... No genes encoding metabolism pro proteins. That's gone. Membrane biosynthesis will probably go too. And so as we sequence more genomes, uh, we, we find more genes. And as, as I say, you know, if you, if you isolate new giant viruses, um, an example of which is here, he's a Mimi virus, um, you find 90% of the sequences are novel. You've never seen them before. You can't find them in any database. You have no idea what they're doing. You know, most many of the genes, you can say, oh, this is a structural protein encoded in this. This is an enzyme of some kind, a polymerase or a protease. 90% of the genes are what we call dark matter. We have no idea what they do. And, but, so this is Mimi virus, which I introduced to you before, and I just want to tell you where the name comes from. Again, it was discovered in France. The, Fran the French have a have a good sense of humor when it comes to naming viruses or saying things about them. And this means microbe mimic, Mimi. And it's because it, when they first saw it, I think it was observed in the contact lens solution of a patient with 
keratitis, right? They had an eye infection. And they looked and they saw these things. They look like bacteria. And as I told you, they put it in the freezer and I didn't go back to it for 10 years. And when they finally figured out it was a virus, they called it Mimi because um, it was a microbe mimic. And then as the French discovered more and more giant viruses, then they called them Mama viruses and Moo Moo viruses. So you, you get what I mean. They have a sense of humor. I appreciate that. Okay, what are the biggest genomes? Here's a list of them. Biggest, the largest known viral genomes. The biggest one, Pandora virus, Salinus or Salinus, 2.4 million bases of double-stranded DNA, encoding 2,500 proteins. Huge. And again, most of these proteins, we have no idea what they are because they don't look like anything we've ever seen. And so these are all on this slide. These are all the giant viruses. You know, they dwarf everybody else. Before we had giant viruses, this would have been a totally different picture. Nothing even close to 600,000 base, bases. I think the biggest viruses were about 350,000 bases. So you can see that goes all the way down. Here's Mama and Mimi. Oh, Moo Moo. And, and uh, I was at a meeting in 20... 18 and someone wrote someone there was a, a, a party where someone sang a song that they had written it's based on that queen song that goes mama you know i forgot the name of that but the, they put all the virus names into it it's great <laughs> uh anyway those are the biggest and just for your comparison by the way this is the length of a bacterial genome haemophilus 1.8 million bases Bohemian Rhapsody, th thank you very much. I love crowdsourcing during lecture. It's great. Um, yeah, you know, the mama part, and they used the mama. Oh, it was great. Uh, Hemophilus is a 1.8 million base pair. Look, it's smaller than the two biggest uh, viral genomes. That's a remarkable. And then here, Nasuia is 112,000 base pair. That is a bacteria that has to live inside another bacteria, right? It's got a highly reduced genome, we say. 112,000 base pairs. It's amazing. So these are really big. About RNA, not even close. These are the three largest known RNA virus genomes, only found in the last couple of years, 41.1 uh, KB of single-stranded plus polarity RNA, a, a virus of planaria, remember those? A virus of aplesia, the, the mollusk that's used, you know, by Eric Kandel to do ne neurological studies and others, of course, and one in a snake. And these are nidoviruses, which is the order that includes the coronavirus family. So SARS-CoV-2 is 30,000 bases. It's not, it's not among the, the largest three. But these are all plus-stranded RNA genomes. So RNA doesn't get very big. Why not? Uh, probably it's fragile and breaks when it gets big. DNA is far more stable. And um, RNA has a higher mutation rate, as we'll explore later. And if you get bigger, you can't handle higher mutation rates because then uh, you, you lose infectivity very rapidly. In fact, these are much bigger than the closest RNA genomes. You know, the closest other RNA virus genomes are 12,000, 15,000 bases at the most. And that's be because these genomes encode error correction mechanisms, and we'll explore that later. How about the smallest known viral genomes? Well, viroid is 120 bases, with, which encodes no protein. It's probably not a virus. Uh, it's a precursor of a virus. It doesn't have a capsid of any kind and so forth. But the smallest encapsidated virus is a, is this satellite, which is 220 uh, bases of RNA and encodes no protein. We'll, we'll explore these. Sa satellite is basically a virus that depends on another virus in order to be reproduced. So this one doesn't encode a protein. So obviously to be encapsidated, it has to be uh, encapsidated by another virus protein, or maybe not at all. And then we have hepatitis delta which is an RNA virus. So notice that the RNA viruses are the three smallest, 1,700 bases, 
encoding one protein. That's also a helper-dependent virus. So helper-dependent means it depends on another virus to reproduce. And hepatitis delta will only reproduce in cells infected by hepatitis B virus, and it's encapsulated in the cope protein of hep B, which we will explore later. But it's very small and encodes only one protein. Then we have some small DNA virus, circoviruses, 1,700 bases, two proteins, anelloviruses, Gemini viruses. These are viruses of plants. Circo and anellos infect all of us. Every one of us in this room has antibodies to those viruses. Then we have hepatitis B and uh, some other viruses as well, RNA viruses here. So quite small at the other end. What information may be encoded in a viral genome? A, gene products that catalyze membrane biosynthesis. B, complete protein synthesis systems. C, centromeres or telomeres, or D, enzymes to replicate the viral genome, So, which is encoded, which may be encoded. Let's see what's happening. Most of you got D, 87% enzymes to replicate the viral genome. That's the only correct answer. What information may be encoded? There's no gene products for membrane biosynthesis. That was a slide I showed you that. There's no complete protein synthesis systems. No complete. There are parts of it, but not complete. And there's uh, no centromeres or telomeres, which you all got. Now, viral DNA genomes, um, these viruses dominate the bacterial virosphere, interestingly. Um, and many of these emulate the host, which is based on DNA, right? In fact, DNA viruses likely originated from the first DNA hosts. Uh, however, most DNA genomes are not like cell chromosomes. Our chromosomes, as you know, are wrapped in histones, uh, wrapped around histones. They're chromatinized, as we say. They have telomeres and so forth. And most viral genomes are not like that. So here's here's what I'm talking about. Viral uh, DNA, cell DNA wrapped around uh, histones. And most viral genomes, in the particle at least, are not like that. Although once the DNA gets into a host cell, they can be chromatinized. And as we'll see as we explore viral DNA rep reproduction, there are specific things that, or mechanisms, I should say, that have evolved that are unique to DNA in a virus compared with a host cell. So let's go through some examples of viral double-stranded DNA genomes. We're going to go through all the seven classes today and give you some examples and how they work. So here we have double-stranded DNA genomes, where you remember is the only configuration that be, can be transcribed to form mRNA. So these DNAs enter the cell. Uh, they, they typically go to the nucleus, although some virus uh, genomes stay in the cytoplasm. Uh, they are transcribed. And, you know, in our cell, in our host cell, transcription only occurs in the nucleus. So... Unless a virus is encoding its own RNA polymerase, it has to go in the nucleus to get mRNA made, which will then go on to make protein. And so here are two different kinds of viruses with double-stranded DNA genomes, and I've divided them according to whether their genomes are copied by host DNA polymerase or their own DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase or DNA-dependent RNA polymerase is an enzyme that copies DNA to make more of it. We have DNA polymerases. We have multiple DNA polymerases encoded in our genome that re reproduce our chromosomes. And these viruses on the left here are reproduced by cell polymerase, DNA polymerase. So that includes these polyomaviruses. There are many other viruses that are in this category, but this is an example. Uh, polyomaviruses, they're small, double-stranded circular DNA genomes. This one's about 5,000 bases of double-stranded DNA. And it's too small to encode a DNA polymerase and everything you need for it to work. So uh, these genomes go into the nucleus and they're reproduced by host DNA polymerase. On the right are viral genomes that encode their own DNA polymerase, and they're all significantly bigger. We have adenoviruses, double-stranded DNA, 30 to 50,000 bases in length. And these, of course, are being used to make vectored COVID-19 vaccines. And we'll, we'll explore using these viruses as vectors in this course. You cut out most of the viral DNA and you put in whatever gene you want. Herpes virus genomes, double-stranded DNA, also with 120 to 240,000 base pairs of genetic information, so much larger. 
and then pox virus, 130 to 375,000 base pairs of DNA. So these are bigger. They encode their own polymerase and many other proteins, as we'll explore when we look into them in some detail. So here are some examples of these viruses that we've mentioned and more. We have the adenoviruses. You'll recognize these because they are unique. They are a capsid with these uh, vertices, these proteins at each vertex. They look like Sputnik, if you remember that. Uh, herpes viruses are enveloped uh, virus particles with an icosahedral capsid. Then the papilloma and polyoma viridae are smaller icosahedral virus particles without a membrane. Uh, and the pox viruses are bigger uh, particles and with complex symmetry. And, and these are all viruses with DNA genomes, double-stranded DNA genomes. And here is a, a giant virus, a pithovirus. This is not even drawn to scale. It wouldn't fit on the slide if I drew, on it, if I drew it to scale. But it has a double-stranded DNA genome. And there's our cork. More for the French naming. They called this a cork, right? Because they like wine. All right, viruses with gapped double-stranded DNA. What is a terminal loop? Oh, uh, terminal loop. Let's see. Sorry, I didn't mention that. That is, you have a double-stranded DNA, you know, and you have five and three prime ends, and you can covalently connect the five and three prime ends, and that gives you a terminal loop. So basically, if you separated the two strands, you'd have a circle here. That's what a terminal loop is. Someone else asked a question here. Is the polyoma genome like a plasmid? Yeah, it is. It's got an origin of replication. If you put this in a eukaryotic cell, it'll reproduce because it's reproduced by the uh, host polymerase. So it's kind of like a plasmid. But plasmids can be really big too. So size is not all that matters. If the virus is giant, does it imply that it only invades large cells? Well, yeah, it couldn't invade a cell that is smaller than it is, right? That that wouldn't make any sense. And so these giant viruses um, are known to infect amoeba, which are pretty big. But they're also supposed... Some people think giant viruses infect humans. So there's, our cells are big enough to accommodate those as well. If the DNA stays in the cytoplasm, then it has to encode its own RNA polymerase. Yeah, it does, unless... It can figure out a way to get it out of the nucleus, and some viral proteins can do that. We, we might talk about them. Gapped double-stranded DNA. So it's a weird configuration. It's in the in the hepatinovirus genome. It's actually in the form of a circle in the particle. So hepatitis B virus is an example of a virus in this family, where the genome is gapped and circular. It has a piece of RNA attached, it has a protein attached, and why it has all of this, you'll see when we talk about the reproduction of these viruses. So I'll save that as a little excitement for later. <laughs> but can this genome be copied to make mRNA? No, only double-stranded DNA can be copied to make mRNA. And it could be circular double-stranded or linear. Either one would can be transcribed, but it has to be double-stranded. So this has to be repaired. So these viral genomes go in the nucleus and the nucleus dutifully repairs it because it doesn't know that it's a viral DNA and it comes in the nucleus, it's broken, it's damaged, and the cell senses it as damaged, so it fixes it. It repairs the gap, it takes off the RNA and the protein, and voila, you have double-stranded DNA. You know, the, the cell is unwittingly assisting in this virus being able to reproduce. And then, since it's double-stranded DNA can be transcribed to make mRNA, which gives rise to proteins. But this virus actually has reverse transcription in its reproduction cycle. And some of these mRNAs are not translated, but they're copied to DNA. And the DNA is then put in the virus particle. We'll explore this in some detail during our reverse transcription uh, discussion. And finally, the last DNA genome, single-stranded DNA, uh, which, again, has to be made double-stranded before it can be transcribed. These viruses actually can package either strand, minus or, or plus, because when these DNAs get into the cell, the first thing that happens is the cell, going, the cell is going to repair it and make it double-stranded. So they can package either one. 
And uh, these come in two flavors. We have circular single-stranded DNA, and these are the circoviruses, which are quite small. One of them is called TT, Torquetenio virus. Maybe someone knows what that means. And this has this infects everyone. Another one, over 90% pre, seroprevalence. And then we have parvoviruses, which can cause human diseases like fifth diseases, but also infections of cats and dogs. That's why you have to vaccinate your cats or dogs against parvoviruses because they can it can kill them. Now, someone asked me if it GAPT has an advantage. No, they, none of these have advantages because they all exist. The GAPS is a is a remnant of reverse transcription. Okay, so I will explain that to you later in that lecture. Which DNA genome on entry into the cell can be immediately copied into mRNA? DSDNA, GAP DNA, circular, linear, all of the above. 94% of you got the right answer, double-stranded DNA. That's the only one that could be transcribed into mRNA. Yeah, GAP DNA can't. None of you picked that. Circular, no. Some of you picked linear, single-stranded DNA. No, can't be transcribed. has to be double-stranded DNA. Remember that. Put that in a memory bank that you'll always remember. You know, it's, if you don't use things, it's hard to remember them. But sometimes you can remember certain things that are important. RNA genomes, my favorite. That's because I've worked on RNA viruses my whole career. But they're really better. But don't tell my DNA virology colleagues. They'll, they'll get defensive. Now here, RNA viruses dominate the eukaryotic virus sphere. Remember I said DNA viruses dominate the prokaryotic virus sphere. But in this case, in, in, the RNA viruses are more numerous in, in eukaryotes, right? And they're rare in bacteria. And I've shown you a picture here to illustrate that. And here are pictures of the different kinds of viruses in vertebrates here on the left panel, plus RNA, double-stranded RNA, or minus RNA. These are all vertebrates. And then on the right is a number of families of each of these viruses in plants. There's plenty of RNA viruses in plants, plenty in invertebrates. But look at this. Bacteria, only one plus RNA family and one plus double-stranded RNA family, no negative strand uh, RNA families. And neither in archaea, ancient archaea, but plenty in other organisms like algae, fungi, yeast, protozoa. So this is an interesting observation, and we'll talk about um, it in more detail when we talk about evolution. Now, a key point here is that cells have no RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to copy these viral RNA genomes. It's another thing you should remember. Just keep saying it over and over. Double-stranded DNA can be transcribed, and cells do not have RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Um, and so every RNA virus needs to encode an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to make mRNA and to copy its genome. And these polymerases, which I abbreviate as RDRP, they make RNA genomes and mRNA from RNA templates. Someone asks, how does the host cell deal with a circle? Does it split the DNA and repair? No, it simply makes the other strand. It can make a circular, it can copy it as a circle or as a linear. And we'll look at that in the DNA replication lecture, so you'll get more on that. Double-stranded RNA viruses. We'll start with some examples. Here we have, remember, the double-stranded RNA cannot be accessed by ribosomes. So it has to be copied by an RNA polymerase to form an mRNA. And of course, the polymerase copies the minus strand, makes mRNA that can be made into protein or may, used to make more double-stranded RNAs by simply copying the plus into a minus strand, right? Now, this copying of double-stranded RNA to mRNA cannot be done by the cell. Cells can't copy viral RNAs. And so these particles, here's an example of a double-stranded RNA virus of humans, rotaviruses, these cause human gastroenteritis, these particles have to have RNA polymerase in them, physically in the particle, so that when the particle gets in, the enzyme can copy the RNA into mRNA. If there's no enzyme there, there's no way that virus is going to work. And many of these viruses are in pieces. So real viruses, of which rotavirus is a member, that's the family. There are 12 segments, and, uh, 12 segments of double-stranded RNA. And then we have... Uh, single-stranded RNA viruses are plus-strand RNA viruses where the genome is the same as mRNA, 
And when it gets into the cell, it is immediately translated. So the viruses do not have to include RNA polymerase in the particle because the RNA can get in the cell and be translated to make the polymerase that's needed. So the RNA gets in the cell, it's translated to make protein, and to make more of that RNA, you go through a minus intermediate, a copy. And that's done, of course, by the RNA polymerase. And here are some viruses with plus sense RNA, the famous coronaviruses, right, which few people had heard of before last year. Uh, they are plus-stranded RNAs with lengths of 27 up to 41.1, which I showed you a, a few members of that class. Flaviviridae, that's a family, 9 to 12 kb RNA. And Flavi would be like yellow fever virus. In fact, the, the family is named after yellow fever. Flavi means yellow in Latin. And when you get infected with yellow fever, you get jaundiced which means your skin and your eye whites particularly get yellow, flavy. Then we have picornaviridae. Also in that family are Zika virus, dengue virus, and many others. Then we have picornaviridae, including poliovirus, 6 to 9 KB, and togaviridae. These are uh, viruses with plus strand polarity as well. We'll talk about a few of them today. And here are some examples. Picornaviridae, poliovirus, and rhinoviruses, common cold viruses. The calisiviridae include the noroviruses that cause gastroenteritis and that infect whales. We introduced initially here some coronaviruses, SARS-MERS and SARS-CoV-2. There, there are four more human coronaviruses, many of animals. Flaviviridae, uh, we've mentioned this. West Nile and hepatitis C, uh, in addition to what I had mentioned, and the togaviridae include rubella virus and equine encephalitis virus, and in different configurations. Some are naked, capsid, some are enveloped. All right, D, a single-stranded plus with a DNA intermediate. There is one viral family called the retroviridae, and within this are many viruses that copy RNA to DNA, but there are two human pathogens, and one of which we'll talk about in its own lecture, HIV, of course, and HTLV. And then there are many other retroviruses of other animals. And these are envelope viruses with an icosahedral capsid. has a very unusual genome strategy, only discovered in the 70s. And these virus particles have RNA plus RNA in them. So in both of these virus particles, inside it is a plus RNA. There are actually two copies of it, and, and we'll talk about why what their function is later. The virus, when it infects the cell, the RNA stays in the particle, never leaves. In the particle, in the cytosol, it's copied first to single-stranded DNA, then to double-stranded DNA. The DNA goes in the nucleus of the cell and integrates into the cell, and there it's transcribed to make mRNA. And so that's the viral genome that's in the particle. And that's what's shown at the top here. And this plus RNA uh, gets incorporated into the virus particle, and that will affect the new cell and start the cycle over again. Then we're moved to our negative strand, single-stranded RNA viruses. Uh, these include both viruses with a segmented genome, orthomyxoviridae, which includes influenza virus. Here it's in eight pieces, and there are also negative strand viruses that are not segmented. These include paramyxoviruses and rhabdoviruses. And again, this negative RNA in the particle, it cannot be translated, right, once it gets into the cell. So there has to be an RNA polymerase in the particle to translate that RNA when it gets into the cell. And mRNA is then made, which encodes proteins. And to reproduce this minus RNA, you go through a plus RNA intermediate. These plus RNAs are not translated ever. Uh, and in fact, the intermediates for both plus and minus RNA viruses. So for a negative RNA virus, it's a plus strand intermediate. For plus RNA viruses, it's a negative strand intermediate. Has no function other than to be a template for the production of more genomes. Doesn't do anything else, as far as we know. So here are some examples of minus single-stranded RNA viruses. The paramyxoviridae would include measles and mumps virus, envelope virus, negative strand RNA. And, and these negative strands, by the way, are typically covered with protein. The plus strand genomes are typically naked. 
with a few exceptions like coronavirus genomes are coated with protein. But all the negative stranded RNAs are coated with protein. That's what you see here in these depictions. Uh, the the rab rhabdoviridae includes rabies virus and also vesicular stomatitis virus, which is a, a virus of cows and which is being used as a vector for some vaccines. There's an Ebola virus vaccine that's based on VSV. And there is a um, experimental COVID-19 vaccine based on VSV. How do cells distinguish between plus RNA to be translated and the one to produce more RNA? Well, plus RNAs, well, so some of those are mRNAs and some of them are going to be packaged. There's, there's no distinction by the cell. You know, if the ribosome gets to the plus RNA, it will translate it. But if the viral polymerase uh, gets to it first, it will make negative stranded RNA. However, there are some controls that are more subtle than that. We'll talk about those when we talk about RNA synthesis. Uh, more RNA negative strand viruses, filoviridae, Ebola viruses, really unusual, long filamentous particles. Here's influenza virus with a segmented negative strand genome. And then uh, arena viruses, Lassa virus. So I, have to, I put this here because this is a very important uh, virus. There are many thousands of infections a year in Africa because the rodent that harbors Lassa virus lives only in Africa. And there's a book about the discovery of Lassa virus called Fever, which uh, came out in the early 70s. And it's a very, very interesting story. And I read this book as a, as a college grad, and I said, I have to do virology. This was my inspiration. And um, part of the story takes place at Columbia. It's a great story. I will save it for later because we have a vaccine lecture where I'm going to talk about that. Now, if you have a segmented genome, uh, let me go back to this picture. Here's a segmented genome. Here's another one, the arena viruses in two pieces. So you can have two or eight or 10 or 12 segments. It depends on the virus. That gives you power that other viruses can't do. You are able to reassort. What is reassortment? So here we have two different influenza virus strains. And one of them has a red RNA. One of them has a blue RNA. And if they both infect the same cell, which can happen, you can get co-infections of cells with different viruses all the time. In this case, the cell will make both RNAs, and the viruses that are made can have either all red RNAs or blue or a mixture. So this R3 virus here has one red RNA and seven blue ones. That's called reassortment because you're reassorting the RNAs from both parents in the progeny, and it's distinct from recombination, which is when a, a long RNA if, if two different RNA viruses are infecting a cell, two different coronaviruses, say, or, yeah, two different coronas, they can exchange pieces of their genome and actually become recombinants. It involves the polymerase switching between the two templates. We'll, we'll explore that later. But reassortment happens only with segmented viruses, and it's very high frequency. It's higher frequency than recombination, and it's one of the reasons why influenza virus causes pandemics every 20 or 30 years, because... Brand new viruses occur where human influenza viruses get segments from animal influenza viruses and they become brand new, which we've never seen before. Someone asked, does the segmented genome run the risk of not packaging a segment? Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons they can have a high particle to PFU ratio. But there are specific mechanisms to make sure you get the right number of segment, segments per particle, which we will talk about in a couple of lectures. So yeah, otherwise you would have a real problem if you didn't have a mechanism. Finally, the ambisense genome. Ambi means both, right? And these have plus and minus polarity segments. And, and the arenas and peribunyaviridae are ambisense. You know, these, these are two RNAs or three RNAs. And so here um, we're looking at a virus with three RNAs. And here's what the RNAs look like. They have part of the genome, which is plus and part which is minus. And so essentially you could in theory translate this plus part, but then the translation would stop at this hairpin here, this, this uh, RNA hairpin. But what happens with these viruses, they actually have an RNA polymerase in the virus particle. And so when these RNAs get into cells, they're not actually translated. They are copied by the polymerase to make mRNAs, which are then translated. So, 
they act like a negative strand virus in that they have an RNA polymerase in the particle. But in, in genome structure, they're ambisense because they have both plus and minus segments. Now, when I draw these RNAs, I'm always drawing a line. But in life, they don't exist as a line. They're, they're in complicated structures that involve a lot of base pairing. So, for example, here is the actual structure of a viral RNA from a plant. And you have stem loop structures where you have base pairing within a local region. And then you can have very extensive stem loop structures like this. And then there are long range interactions and shown in red. These red segments are base pairing with each other. And that has functional consequence. So RNAs in solution or in virus particles are not lines. They're actually complicated structures. Here's another example, an RNA structure in the HIV 5 prime leader, a lot of stem loops. And the structure of this was solved uh, at three dimensions, and this is actually what it looks like. That's what this RNA looks like. So even our depiction of these stem loops isn't right. They have uh, a dimensionality that we can't really show in these line diagrams. Which statement about viral RNA genomes is correct? A, single-stranded plus sRNA genomes may be translated to make viral protein. Double-stranded RNA genomes can be directly translated to make viral protein. C, plus single-stranded RNA virus replication cycles do not require a minus-strand intermediate. D, RNA genomes can be copied by host cell RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, or all of the above. Most of you got A, which is correct. Single-stranded <clears throat> plus RNA genomes may be translated. They may be, yes. Double-stranded genomes can't be translated. Remember, the plus strand is there, but it's blocked by the minus strand. Plus do not require a minus strand. To make more plus strands, you have to go through a minus strand intermediate, so that's wrong. RNA genomes can be copied by host cell RNA polymerase. No. I made a point of saying they can't be. There's no RNA polymerase in a host cell that will copy those. And obviously all of the above is not right. I want to now end up this lecture about genetics of animal viruses and how you manipulate the genome. Now, before the modern era, the way you made mutants was to take a virus and treat it with a mutagen, like a chemical or UV light, and then you would do a plaque assay, and you could pick a plaque, and maybe that would have a specific mutation that would give you a phenotype that you were interested in. It was quite laborious, but this is not how we do it anymore. Before I tell you how we do it, I want to do some nomenclature here, uh, and that is specifically how we call changes in nucleic acids and proteins, and a mutation is a change in DNA or RNA. That's it. That's all it is. It can be an addition of a nucleotide, a deletion, a rearrangement, but it's a change in DNA or RNA. And these mutations can lead to amino acid changes, which can be substitutions, additions, or truncations. But the changes in the protein is not a mutation because a mutation is only what you do to, to nucleic acid. And I mention this because even my colleagues don't use this correctly. Like if you, if you look at the the information circulating these days about SARS-CoV-2 variants, they will say there's a spike mutation. There's a mutation in the spike protein. And it drives me crazy because it's not a mutation. It's it's an amino acid change. What's so difficult about getting that? So mutation is a change in DNA or RNA. This is old. This was established years ago. Why do we have to change it? And as I said, in the old days, mutations were introduced by mutagenesis. You treat a virus with UV or with chemicals, random mutagenesis, hard to get what you want. But nowadays, we don't do that. We have the modern way. We can engineer mutations because for every virus that we work with, we have an infectious DNA clone. We have a DNA copy of the genome, and we can put that in cells by a process called transfection. And if you think about it, that's a modern validation of the Hershey Chase experiment, right? Because you put DNA in, and out come viruses. DNA is genetic material, and you can make all kinds of changes in DNA with enzymes and PCR. You can make base changes, deletions. You can put other genes into viral genomes, like if you want to make a vaccine out of a virus vector. So we do all of that, and we use plasmids to carry these viral genes and viral genomes. So let me show you an example of that. So this, this word transfection was first coined by an experiment where they took a bacteriophage called lambda, a DNA bacteriophage. They extracted the DNA and they put that DNA into bacteria and out came bacteriophage lambda. And so 
they called this transfection because it means transformation. Transformation means putting DNA into cells. Infection. Transformation leads to infection, so it's called transfection. Nowadays, people use the word to mean just putting DNA in cells, and I'll give them that. I can't argue for every misuse of the English language, right? So transfection, putting DNA into cells, in our case, to get a virus out. And it can be DNA or it can be RNA, actually. And here's one example for poliovirus, which is a virus with an RNA genome. It's just plus polarity. When you put this RNA into cells by transfection, which you can do, it's translated and initiates an infectious cycle. You get virus. Uh, what you can also do is make a DNA copy of that RNA in a plasmid, and you can put that plasmid into cells, and it will initiate an infection because it's transcribed in the nucleus and makes the mRNA for the virus. Or better yet, you do in vitro RNA synthesis. You can put a promoter in this plasmid for a bacteriophage RNA polymerase like T7, and then you in incubate the DNA in vitro with the enzyme, and you make RNA in vitro, and you can transfect that. And we do this in our lab all the time, and we make nanogram quantities of RNA in vitro using this system, and we manipulate our viruses this way. And I, I mention that because the Moderna and Pfizer mRNA vaccines are made by this process. They have a plasmid encoding the spike glycoprotein of SARS-CoV-2. They put a T7 promoter in front of it. They incubate it with T7 RNA polymerase, except they don't make nanograms. They make kilograms of RNA, and that blows me away. I got to tell you, you know, when I make RNA in the lab, I get nanograms, and I'm really happy. And, you know, each person gets 200 micrograms of the mRNA vaccine. So, yeah, wow, this is bloody amazing. Kilograms of RNA. I was raised in an RNA lab, and I was told, don't look at RNA because it'll break up. It's so, it's so delicate. And we're sticking it in people's arms. Unbelievable. And I think it's cool, by the way. So I got immunized last night. And, and I'm thinking, I'm, I got spike protein being made in my arm. How cool is that? A year ago, I would never have thought that that could happen. It's just amazing. One more example of making virus from DNA copies. And this is a little different because not every virus is the same as polio. That's pretty easy. You clone the genome in a plasmid. That's been done for SARS-CoV-2 early on, no problem, because we want to be able to ma manipulate the virus. For influenza, it's hard because you have eight RNA segments, right? So what they had to do is make eight plasmids, each plasmid encoding one of the eight RNA segments, and they put two promoters in these plasmids. So here is one, one of the RNA segments as a DNA copy, and at one end they have a PAL2 promoter, and that's the promoter for RNA polymerase II that makes mRNA from DNA. So that promoter will make mRNA so that you can get the viral proteins. And then they have a PAL1 promoter on the other strand to give you the minus strand viral RNA, which needs to be packaged in genomes. So you take eight, eight of these plasmids and you put them in a cell all together and out comes influenza virus. So you can make any influenza virus you want. And this, now, now we make the vaccines this way. Uh, we engineer them to have the right spike protein that's circulating currently, and uh, we make the virus. It's just brilliant. Now, this was really done, this was this method was used in a cool way for influenza to recover the 1918 pandemic virus. That's the last huge, devastating pandemic, right? This killed many, many millions of people globally. But in 1918, we did not have influenza virus. So, you know, we didn't influence, isolate the virus until 1933. So in 2005, investigators isolated RNA from formalin-fixed lung tissue samples. So that many people in the Army died of flu during the 1918 outbreak, and the Army kept a lot of their lung tissues in an archive. So they went back to this, they extracted the RNA, and they sequenced it. At the same time, they also got RNA from a person who had died from flu in 1918, and they were buried in a place that was always frozen. So they opened the grave, and they did a biopsy of the lung, and they sequenced that RNA too. And from that, they could actually reassemble all eight segments of the 1918 influenza virus genome, put it in plasmids, and they recovered the virus. And of course, they did this in a BSL-4 laboratory, a high containment lab, because you don't want this virus getting out again. But it's been studied ever since then.
by the way, this is uh, a picture of what it was like in 1918, you know, big areas full of beds. It's kind of the same thing that's happening in many places now because hospitals get overrun. Now, a lot of people didn't like this experiment. They thought it was too dangerous. And I think you need to do certain kinds of science to, to move the field forward and improve, improve human health. So I am not one of the people that is against these. If you do them properly under the right containment, but there's some people who think you can never do it right and they're gonna be accidents, and I just don't agree with that. And one more example of this, this is quite interesting. Uh, so the flu example, they actually cloned the segments of, the, of each RNA segment in a plasmid, right? But you don't have to do any cloning, actually. And here's an example for horsepox virus. This is an extinct virus of horses, but the sequence is known of the genome. And so investigators simply made this DNA in a lab. They chemically synthesized 10 overlapping DNAs adding up to the genome, which, by the way, cost $150,000. They took these 10 DNAs and put them all into cells together. They recombined in this cell, and out came horsebox virus. And here are the 10 overlapping fragments. You overlap them so you have a good chance of getting recombination. And they put some markers in so they knew this was recovered from, from DNA. And of course, this raised hackles too. Here is an, a, a headline, scientists bring back extinct horsepox virus raising important biosecurity questions. This is a 2017 article. I think if you do these, and we can't, we don't have time to do this discussion now, but if you do these experiments carefully, they can be done properly. Anyway, the U.S. a number of years ago made a committee called the NSABB, which is a federal advisory committee to help guide research with dual use potential. Dual use means it can have a good outcome uh, or someone could use it for bad outcomes, someone with bad intentions, a bad actor could use it for harming people, and that's called dual use. So if you want to do an experiment like um, recovering 1918 influenza virus, you'd have to get approval from this committee in the U.S. if you use federal funds because they have to make sure you're doing it under the right containment, and I think that's the way to regulate uh, this research. But there's a lot of controversy over this, and you can find all kinds of articles about it online. All right, so that is Genomes and Genetics. Next time, Monday, we're going to explore the structure of viruses, what different kinds of structures exist and, and how they are built uh, in infected cells.